Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the What Is Money show. I am sitting down again today with Mr. Jeff Snyder, who is an expert in the euro dollar system and global macroeconomics and central banking more generally. And we're continuing our, uh, basically, we're walking our way through history. We, we've come through the 20th century. Now we're into the early 21st century. Um, and we want to talk about the great financial crash of 2008, also known as the GFC of 2008, today. Uh, and traditionally, the conventional wisdom is that this was strictly a subprime mortgage market catastrophe. But uh, as you've done excellent work in this area, Jeff, and shedding light on the truth, it seems like it has a lot more to do with the euro dollar system. Uh, more broadly. And I know there's a lot of elements to this. So where do you think we should start to peel back the layers? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a very complex topic, Robert. I mean, you know, as we've been spending hour upon hour going through, there's a lot to the monetary system, bank evolution, money evolution in the decades preceding it. Yeah. So you can imagine how there's a lot to it when it all starts to break down in 2007 and 2008. But you can understand from most people, you know, the public perspective, you know, what they knew of that era before the you know, 2008 crash was a housing bubble, right? The U.S. went into a typical housing bubble and therefore, you know, ninja loans, all sorts of, you know, ridiculously insane mortgage products. It kind of sounded like this subprime mortgage thing is a plausible explanation for what happened. You know, the market got way ahead of itself. Prices got out of itself. You know, there was ridiculous levels of, of, of credit creation, mm -hmm. which is hallmark of any type of bubble period. And then it just collapsed. So it sounds like, uh, you know, again, it, it's a plausible theory for what happened, except when you step back and you start examining some of the details. Number one, how do you get a global financial crisis from what would be a regional or national U.S. housing bubble. That doesn't make mm -hmm. sense already. Mm -hmm. Number two, if you actually look at what banks were doing and, and the losses they were taking, there's no way subprime mortgages created that amount of financial destruction. In fact, mm -hmm. policymakers at the Federal Reserve, at the FDIC and the OCC and elsewhere said there just was not nearly enough loss potential from subprime mortgages alone that could possibly explain how bad it actually got. And so given that, you start to examine, OK, what else could have gone wrong in 2008? Yes, there was absolutely a housing bubble in the United States beforehand. But what else was going on and what else could possibly go wrong? And that's where you start looking into some of the monetary details. And then you realize it wasn't just about subprime mortgage or even just the U.S. housing market. That was just one offshoot of what was, as we talked about before, gross global monetary excesses of that euro dollar system. Mm -hmm. So it kind of stands to reason the place to start is, okay, we have housing bubble in the US and credit bubble, especially corporate credit around the rest of the world. And then something changed. So maybe that's probably the place to start rather than looking at subprime mortgages, we have monetary excess. And then we have all the telltale signs of really a monetary shortage or monetary squeeze or a bank run. It really, in mm -hmm. a lot of ways, mm -hmm. if you distill what happened in 2008, it looks a lot like a historic bank run, which is, you know, monetary issues. Yeah. And so this would be a bank run on collateral itself? Bank run of all these modern euro dollar types of monetary formats. And collateral is absolutely one of the most, uh, you know, in fact, it was probably where things broke down the most is that, mm. you know, beforehand you had, plentiful creation, plentiful uh, access and redistribution of collateral. Then all of a sudden, starting with subprime mortgage collateral, mortgage bonds that were you know, less than real quality, the market, especially in repo, started to look at some of these things and say, now we valued these at X and that probably wasn't a great idea. So let's start revaluing these collateral pieces as something less than X, which is nothing more than a margin call on the system. Mm. What we found out was that the, the system couldn't meet that margin call because it was not it was there was there was insufficient levels of additional collateral, insufficient levels of margin in the system. This is where credit default swaps and derivatives mm. and everything comes into it, that it was this mm. monetary system that appeared to be robust and going you know, to insane levels was actually quite fragile once it started to doubt itself, which is, again, the telltale sign of a historic bank run, because they always, you know, the system always looks robust until it doesn't. Right, Eventually right. Yeah. I'm, I'm reminded of 
I think it was Buffett that when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked type of thing, right? Everything looks great on the surface until there's a shock of some kind and then people get caught with their pants down, so to speak. Uh, is this, this collateral? So first of all, I guess we could define collateral. Is it majority government bonds? I know that like U S treasuries would, I guess, be one of the most, uh, used forms of collateral worldwide. Um, it's- and then do these structures, because this seems to be a recurrent pattern that at least, and maybe this applies to financial systems more broadly, but I know at least in the fiat system that these credit structures become illiquid over time. Uh, and then the shock hits, the inevitable shock hits, and there's a rush into collateral and it's a bank run dynamic, as you describe. And the demand for liquidity is just overwhelming, which leads to central bank stimulus. Yeah, and I, exactly. That's, you know, the pattern here, when you step back and look at it, it's, it's nothing different than a historical bank run. It's exactly, you know, Human nature, we talked about before, there's always excesses that get involved in the system and they just become too much. And it reaches a point where once the snowball snowball starts rolling down the hill in the other direction, there's no way to stop it because mm. it just, you know, it gets too far too fast. But we need to understand before going into the financial crisis, and I think we talked about this briefly, was that collateralized lending, collateralized funding had become a really huge part of how the global monetary system functioned in the decades before the financial crisis. What that meant was, you know, I'm a bank, you're a bank, we could do, you know, I I have excess cash, or I claim I have excess cash, or I can create excess cash on my balance sheet, and you want excess cash because you want to do something and you want to borrow my cash from me. And I'm using scare quotes when I talk about cash here because there's no actual physical Federal Reserve notes. There's obviously no gold or anything here. It's just I claim I have a cash or equivalent and you want to borrow my balance sheet capacity, essentially. Interbank liabilities, right? Exactly. And and if you and I know each other well, we can do what's called an unsecured interbank transaction, which is something like federal funds or, you know, the Mm -hmm. basic euro dollar transaction, which is I have excess reserves or excess cash. You need them overnight. You call me up. I say, okay, I'm going to lend you them. We don't do anything else. And then tomorrow you repay me with a little bit of interest. There's no security. There's no collateral. It's just an unsecured transaction. Mm-hmm. That's kind of goes back a very long time and how the interbank markets first developed, you know, but late in the 19th century with correspondent bank, res- uh, bank balances and things like that. But as the marketplace, this interbank marketplace expanded, you know, in this euro dollar period, you know, you're not going to come to, you're not going to lend cash always to people, you know. And so how do you how do you create a, a robust marketplace where one bank may not know the other the counterparty on the other side? And the easy way to bridge that uh, reputational divide or le- information asymmetry divide is to just demand some collateral. I don't know you, Robert, but you still want to borrow cash from me. So I'm just going to say, look, mm. give me the rights of seizure on some kind of financial asset that you own. Therefore, our overnight interbank loan is collateralized by some kind of financial asset, and we can do the same transaction. You can borrow my excess cash overnight, and we're all safe and everything's great. Mm-hmm. We don't have nobody has to worry about any of these things, right? And that's that's kind of how the repo market started to become a robust, really backbone of this global euro dollar system, is because this is sounds really easy, sounds really risk free, right? And it, in theory, it should have been that way. But as you know, human nature over time, these things start to get bastardized. For example, um, you're a bank someplace, and it doesn't matter where, and you have all of these mortgages. Mortgage loans are illiquid, and you want to be able to fund these illiquid loans in the most efficient manner possible, which would mean you want to go into the repo market to fund essentially illiquid loans. How do you do that? Well, you want to get to the repo. One way you could do it is to borrow some financial assets that are liquid from somebody else. And this that gave rise to what's called securities lending, mm. which was, okay, I'm going to borrow a U.S. treasury because government assets are the safest, most liquid assets, and they're treated that way in the repo market. Therefore, it gives you the cheapest overnight funding cost. So you pay a little bit of an extra principal or a little bit of extra interest to a dealer to lend you a security that you don't own that you're going to then repledge into the marketplace as if you had that treasury and the market, you, the, 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 uh, the funding that you secure in the interbank market using that U S treasury that you've borrowed is the cheapest, best funding. And because Mm -hmm. everybody wants to, to, uh, you know, uh, yield the most leverage they possibly can on their asset. 
Right. So you've borrowed a U.S. Treasury to do that to fund your illiquid mortgage loans. Another way you could do this is to take those illiquid mortgage loans and turn them into a liquid security, Mm -hmm. which was the magic of securitization Mm -hmm. that developed in the 70s and 80s with the, you know, the imprimatur and stamp of the U.S. government through the GSEs on these things. So that by the time we get to the 1990s and forward, some of these mortgage bonds and some of them were good and some of them were not, you know, some some kind of questionable these mortgage bonds that were created as the, the end process of securitization were treated in repo markets as if they were equivalent to U.S. Treasuries. Wow. So you can already see where we're starting wow. to get yeah. into yeah. the potential for things going wrong. Right. <laughs> so then you have you know the late 90s and middle 2000s. You have the massive creation of mortgage bonds. You have private label ABS securities that are being treated as if they're the same as U.S. Treasuries. And they're supporting all of this interbank funding activity in the repo market as if they are good quality collateral. Mm. And again, everybody's trying to reach as much leverage as they possibly can. So as everything's moving forward, and as long as this collateral is maintained at the same or very nearly the same as the highest quality collateral, nothing seems to go wrong. And everybody thinks this is all just risk-free, terrific. You know, we, everybody's secured, right? Right. Can't possibly be any risk here because I'm lending cash. I have the right to seize the best quality collateral there is in the marketplace, whether it's a borrowed U.S. Tre- treasury or some kind of mortgage bond structure. And everybody thinks this is all awesome. And therefore, everybody's taking as much risk as they possibly can. Balance sheets are all growing because there's ample amounts of funding. There's ample amounts of collateral. Everything's safe. Everything's and terrific. Leverage ratio is exploding, right? Absolutely. In funding, everything, it's leverage ratios in every way imaginable. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, as all this is going on, the other thing you should keep in mind is we're talking about collateral repo, all this stuff. Where does the Federal Reserve get involved? You know, where would the Federal Reserve possibly do if something goes wrong in mortgage bonds in mm-hmm. terms of repo collateral? How does the Fed fix something like that? Because that's not what the Fed actually <laughs> does. And going back to what we said before, this monetary system that spans the entire world had evolved over decades without a central authority in it. In fact, it evolved right. around the central authority. In some ways, that was that was kind of the point mm-hmm. to, to get around regulations. That's why everybody went offshore to begin with. But you have all this collateralized uh, lending activity. And you know the collateral doesn't just support repo. It also supported all these derivatives, interest rate swaps, currency swaps, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Collateral is a key part of this entire global whole funding mix. And so it was really a major, major point, you know, a major, major fault line and potential point of failure should everything start to go wrong or, you know, we start to revalue some of this high quality collateral as maybe not as high quality as we think. Then right. what do you do? There's just, there's just no margin for error at that point. That's, that's super interesting. Um, I, lo- I really appreciate the point you just made where subprime securitization it ends up getting priced as if it's as risk less as a U.S. Treasury, which if you just think through that, it's absurd. So you're implying that the counterparties, you know, borrowing money to go buy a house have the same credit worthiness as the U.S. government that can effectively print <laughs> print money to pay their debt. So it, does, it just you know, it doesn't make intuitive sense it's, at all. It's actually even worse than that because you have to think about this as a repo market participant does. Mm. So we break it down into individual cases. You, you, Robert, you're borrowing my cash and you're giving me a mortgage bond security as collateral. Now, my, I don't care one bit about the mortgage borrowers in the pool that created that security. I could not care less about whether or not they can pay their loans, what their houses are worth or anything like that. The only thing I care about is if tomorrow morning you say, I'm not going to give you your cash back. I have the right to seize your mortgage bond. I'm going to sell it to get my cash back. Right. So the only thing I care about that mortgage bond is if tomorrow morning that mortgage bond has a market into which I can sell it. And mm-hmm. that market is dependable enough that I can sell it at a price I need to sell it at to get all my cash back. If, however, the mortgage bond market itself starts to go soft where it start to think, wait a minute. I don't really care about the credit characteristics of the mortgage bond, but suddenly the market for mortgage bonds isn't so dependable. Right. It's really about the liquidity of the marketplace, it's about the money market itself, where you look at the mortgage bond. It's not really about defaults and all that kind of stuff. It's about 
can I take this collateral and sell it if I need to? And there's a very famous example that happened in late August of 2007, where Morgan, uh, I believe it was Merrill Lynch, actually had to seize the security from one of these hedge funds, these high quality yeah. you know, hedge funds that were failing and that were repoing these uh, collateral out. And what they found was when they went to sell these mortgage securities the next morning because the hedge fund had defaulted on the cash, there was no market for them. And that wow. sent shockwaves through the entire global marketplace because all of a sudden you had what was supposed to be the safest interbank funding mechanism creating for Merrill Lynch this mass, maybe it's not Merrill, I can't remember off the top of my head, but mm. one of the big Wall Street banks was, was given this, you're not supposed to lose money on these safe transactions. Yet here mm. we have this one of the safest transactions suddenly introducing the possibility of serious risk in it. And you can imagine the ripples throughout the collateral markets right. because every, sing, every single lender and dealer from that point forward started to look at their collateral and say, maybe this isn't as what I thought it was. And it's not about, you know, again, it's not about people paying the mortgages. It's about it's the, the mortgage mark, the market. liquidity, market liquidity yeah. and things like that. And that's when things really started to go wrong. Because if you can't, if, if repo lenders can't depend upon their collateral, that starts to pare down the list of acceptable collateral into narrower and narrower and narrower buckets, yes. which means everybody gets herded into those. Or the worst case scenario, you know, if you don't have good quality collateral, what is your other option? You have to start fire sailing assets or distress mm -hmm. sailing assets. And what does that do to market liquidity? Systemic shock, right? <laughs> Exactly. And yeah. it becomes this vicious cycle, right? Yeah. Because you're now forced into distress sales, which reduces yeah. the prices of the in the marketplace, which yeah. then more, you know, all of these repo lenders are saying, yeah. oh, this, this market isn't dependable. I don't know what price I'm going to get, which then creates more fire sales, which then, you know, it becomes this vicious cycle in which there's no way out of it. Mm. And that's really what started. And we know the day it started. It started on August 9th of 2007. That was the day when all of these things really hit. And that's when the, the, the ball, this little snowball started rolling down the hill. And it started with, you know, mortgage bond collateral. And it wasn't necessarily specific about, you know, subprime mortgage borrowers being able to pay their loans. It was about liquidity in the mortgage bond market space, which was no longer dependable. So it's a, it's really is a money supply issue more than anything else. So interesting. Um, and so that that is mechanically how the tide goes out effectively is the expectations now shift towards this continuous downdraft. People are forced into margin calls or they're thinking, I better sell now versus later. And the whole thing just unwinds in a, in a vicious cascading um, liquidity collapse effectively. Yeah. And that, then it gets to be really serious when um, you get the uh, you know, Bear Stearns, for example, Bear Stearns got to the brink of bankruptcy and insolvency, not because it was losing money from, you know, borrowers who weren't uh, paying on their mortgages, mm -hmm. but because it ran out of collateral. Mm -hmm. It was participating in funding all of its act. I mean, Bear Stearns was not some subprime mortgage peddler. Mm -hmm. Bear Stearns was an old Wall Street name that did investment banking the way you're supposed to do investment banking, which meant they had a huge repo book. That was how they funded most of what they were doing. And you know, they didn't have bad collateral, but they didn't have enough collateral to survive the revaluation of the collateral they had been using. And because right. they had been using this collateral in what's called tri-party repo, where JP Morgan was essentially standing between you and the borrower, at some point, JP Morgan, this was, you know, March 2008, JP Morgan said, you know, Bear, if you want to continue to borrow in the, this tri-party repo market, I believe they needed something like six or seven billion in good quality collateral in order for Bear Stearns to continue. And Bear Stearns didn't have these U.S. treasuries in their inventory, and they couldn't borrow them from anybody because they were shut out of the repo markets. Hmm. And so Bear Stearns was brought to the brink of failure, not by subprime mortgages, not by credit losses, but because it didn't have enough collateral. Wow. Now, this was, this was a repeating, recurring problem. That's what brought Lehman. Lehman Brothers failed because it couldn't meet J.P. Morgan's collateral call. Right. AIG failed because it couldn't meet tripartite repo collateral calls. Right. 
Wow. Uh, let me ask, so were Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers excessively leveraged relative to oh. other peers or was there? No. I, I've, I've <laughs> they were often... excessively leveraged, but not relative. I mean, they weren't doing anything different than anybody else, right. but they were excessively leveraged. <laughs> so agreed. Just, everybody was. <laughs> That's my general understanding of it. My, my question that I'm not clear on at all is, was there a political game behind this? Like why Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers? Were there certain in groups or out groups or families that were maybe better able to protect their interest in say JP Morgan or another bank versus Lehman. Is there any story there at all as why, why Bear Stearns and Lehman were allowed to fail, whereas others were nationalized or, or um, bailed out, I guess. Well, Bear Stearns, you know, technically they didn't fail because they were, they were shepherded into JP Morgan's waiting arms with a, a significant amount of Federal Reserve uh, assistance. Right. But I mean, I don't think there's any political story behind it other than the fact that as far as Ben Bernanke was concerned at the time was we need to, we need to nip this crisis in the bud. Mm. And he thought that was the best way to do it because, you know, wrongly uh, thinking back to LTCM in 1998, Mm -hmm. He thought that's what kind of you need to do, you know, introduce some a little bit of moral hazard, but it's worth the it's worth the risk of moral right. hazard to get the systemic crisis to stop. And of course, that was never true. In fact, Bear Stearns was probably the point, the moment when there was the, the point of no return, because you have to think about this from the perspective of the banks and the bank managers operating the system. They didn't look at Bear Stearns as a successful rescue. They look at it as. One of the oldest names in Wall Street was snuffed out. Their hmm. equity was worthless. All the money they made, all the capacities, and all of a sudden they were being forced into J.P. Morgan at, at essentially zero, zero uh, benefit to the Bear Stearns. Yeah. So their object from that point forward was to realize, holy crap, this is a really big crisis that just took down one of Wall Street's biggest names. I don't want to be the next one. Hmm. I don't want to, I don't want Jay Powell to tell me where I'm going to be taken over by somebody else. Right. And so that kicked off a, a, an entire period where late leading up to Lehman where the system, everybody in that system began to try to protect themselves, which is the last part of the vicious cycle in any bank run, right? Because it becomes, nobody's willing to take any risk anywhere. And it comes, you know, something we talked about before, you know, backwards elasticity or negative elasticity, which is when, the price of money is because money becomes so short in supply, the price goes up. But rather than induce people to lend more money as the price goes up, they actually lend less because the price going up in money signals that there's something really wrong. And if there's something really wrong, the last thing you want to be is Bear Stearns. Wow. And part of that was, I don't have collateral. I better hold, I better hoard the best quality of collateral, which raises the price of good collateral which doesn't induce more collateral hits the system. In fact, it breaks everything down further. And so Bear Stearns was probably the worst thing that they could possibly have done because it didn't nip the systemic crisis in the bud. It proved that this was really a big deal, that this really was more than just subprime mortgages or a little niche thing in the housing, not U.S. housing. And of course, we have to remember during this whole period, it wasn't just U.S. banks. You have nationalizations going on in Europe. You've got trouble with Japanese banks who can't borrow in U.S. dollars. Mm. It really was a global financial crisis because what was going wrong was the global financial system. Mm -hmm. It was a global dollar shortage. And again, it's, in many ways, it was nothing different than a historical bank run, except that this time was probably the first time in history that the only panicking was done by the banks themselves. It wasn't the public. It was basically right. these interbank markets that were breaking down. Wow, super interesting. Okay, so I guess to your earlier point, all of the these balance sheets of banks had become, well, I guess both collateral and the balance sheets themselves are effectively money at this point, right? They're being issued um, by both governments, central banks, and other banks as just interbank liabilities. Uh, so this is just adding leverage to the system effectively. And in then every, every way possible. Yeah. And then it gets so the, the thing that jumps to mind here is trust minimization. So like this is a key property of money. Like if I hand you gold, you don't need to trust me or believe in my ideas. Like I've paid you to render me the service um, that effectively these monetized balance sheets become um, a method of trust minimization effectively, right? Or using collateral. Uh, 
but then when it, but there's a collateral shortage. So then when the tide goes <laughs> out, you, it gets so bad, you have reverse elasticity, which, I mean, just so I can say this back to you, tell me if I'm saying it correctly, the interest rate on money is exploding. So the incentive to lend is very high, but the uncertainty that is taken as a signal of greater uncertainty in the marketplace amid a cascading uh, you know, collapse of the systemic credit structure so that people are hoarding even more cash which is the opposite of what a market would you would expect, right? The interest rate would go up. You you're incentivized to lend it out. Is that money like because that rings uh, the Veblen good? I don't know if you, I'm sure you've heard of this. Where the the higher the price for a Veblen good, the higher the demand. So it's almost like the higher the price of money in these circumstances, the higher the demand actually becomes for money. So it really sounds like it's just perverting the market mechanism itself. It's yeah. And in some ways it's counterintuitive, right? Because you would expect that, you know, as you said, as we just talked about, repo is supposed to be safe. It's supposed to raise the level of trust in the system Mm -hmm. because I am collateral. I have collateral. Mm -hmm. But if you suddenly start to doubt the collateral and, you know, what is the point of collateral then at that point? It's, 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 it's instead of being a reassuring element to the system, it actually is part of the contagion. Mm-hmm. It actually does the opposite of what you would want it to do. And, you know, as you said, the price of then money and collateral goes through the roof. But you got to remember that everybody in the financial world operates on risk adjusted price. Mm-hmm. So the nominal price of money goes through the roof. But everybody's sitting back thinking, well, yeah, the nominal price is up, but I have no idea what's going on. So the risk adjusted price right. is actually really, really low. In fact, right. it might even be negative. So as the nominal price of money goes up, dealers continue to sit on their hands because they think the risk adjusted price is probably negative. And that's right. where you get backwards elasticity from. And the, the part of the problem is, you know, even in collateral, and this is the part we didn't get into because this is where you really go down the rabbit hole is that when we talk, I just briefly talked about before that, you know, reusing other collateral rehypothecation and all these other things that collateral itself is actually much more fluid and fungible than it quote unquote should be right. You know, in a really riskless transaction, as we, you know, the simple case that we talked about before you lend me a treasury as collateral, I lend you cash. That treasury is something you own. It's a piece of paper that's stamped with the federal government's, uh, you know, U S government's name on it. And therefore it actually is security. You own that piece of paper. You give it to me and say, if I default, you can sell it because that's, that's what our arrangement is. It's just, that is a riskless transaction, but that is not what happens in these marketplaces. Instead, everything's all electronic based to begin with. But number two, I have no idea where you got that security from anyway. Now in the pre-crisis area, I didn't really care because, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, fluidity to an, uh, a system that's exponentially growing and taking on risk. But as things break down, if you were borrowing that treasury from somebody else and that person say was borrowing the same treasury from somebody else and that person was borrowing the same right. treasury from someone else. So you've got reuse and rehypothecation, repledging mm-hmm. all throughout the system. Then it's not like, you know, we're doing a simple risk-free repo transaction. When we have a problem in collateral, it doesn't just break down for you and me. It breaks down for you and me and the other guy and the other guy and the other guy and the other guy. It becomes an even bigger systemic issue because the collateral itself isn't just fungible in terms of the market price of it. It's fungible in who owns the damn thing. You know, whose whose treasury is it? I mean, it's and so in the securities lending world, in the collateral world, there's actually a multiplier. And it's actually like fractional mm-hmm. reserve lending of collateral, where the mm. system creates additional collateral through reuse and repledging and rehypothecation, which only, you know, and when times are good, that means it's, it, it seems like it's robust and, you know, the system is operating very well. But it also introduces, a, an, you know, an amplification factor where things go wrong. Here you have another potential point of contagion and confusion. And, you know, as we said before, information asymmetry, which, you know, introduces this element of not trusting the system, which mm-hmm. creates then backwards elasticity and everything else. So we have the one place where everything's supposed to be risk-free, everything's supposed to be above board, very simple and easy. When and in fact, it started to go in the wrong direction, it became the primary point of failure. Mm. And that's really difficult to not just identify and, and work around, but to figure out how do you fix this? Because right. 
how, you know, when, when the, you know, if you're thinking about building a building and the main element, main structure elements of that building begin to fail, you can't, you know, it's, it's really hard to fix. How do you stop the, uh, how do you stop the cascade from becoming something, something more severe? Right. And that's so, really what, what happened. Hey everybody. As you've no doubt learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to get Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible. One of the ways they are accomplishing this mission is by empowering banks and financial technology companies to offer their own Bitcoin products and services. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yen Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and has quickly become a leader in this space. So whether you are a professional investor looking for asset management services or a company looking to white label your own Bitcoin product or service, consider Nidig your single source solution for everything Bitcoin. So what I'm hearing here is that it's actually the poor quality of the information systems themselves that are contributing to rehypothecation, or we could just say additional leverage coming into the system as a result of having poor information. Has this treasury been reborrowed? Who else has a claim on it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and just to like speak in general terms, I think a, a Bitcoin type asset, if it was used exclusively as collateral, would largely close that gap, right? It would just be, yes. do you have possession of the Bitcoin? It's not even possible to rehypothecate if you've taken delivery of it because it's just, it's a bearer asset, right? Um, similar with gold, but gold's much more limited in portability. So to execute the frequency yes. of final settlement or convertibility, too, I think too you called too it. Too cumbersome. There's not enough gold. It's not redistributed, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yes. And it's really the potential you think about blockchain technology, Bitcoin specifically, but blockchain technology, which would reveal provenance of things like collateral, right? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be able to, I mean, you could reuse and rehypothecate in theory, but that reuse and rehypothecation would be transparent. Mm -hmm. Everybody operating it. And it, you, what you said, Robert, really, I think hits the nail on the head here, which is information asymmetry throughout this financial system. It's mm -hmm. dark, it's opaque. You know, the euro dollar is essentially a is a decentralized ledger, but it's not it's not transparent even across those who are able to access that ledger and create ledger because you know we don't know what everybody's doing on the other side. We don't know where this collateral is coming from. We're just kind of fooling ourselves into thinking. Oh, we've got these secured financing, you know, secured funding transactions as they're known nowadays. And it's supposed to be, you know, riskless and easy and trans transparent, but it's actually the opposite. Mm -hmm. And we've kind of just fooled ourselves into thinking that's the case that allowed us for that end purpose, which is leverage. Yes. That's really what this is all about. We're kind of fooling ourselves and the public into thinking everything we're doing is safe, above board, prudent. When in yeah. fact, it's actually disguising the fact that it's not. Right, right, right. No, that's well said. I think then we could at least agree that the poor resolution enabled by the existing information systems contributes to this contagion, right? It becomes, and, and which contributes to when it cuts the other direction, uns, as you said, everyone's pricing things in risk-adjusted terms. The risk-adjusted terms uh, push you disproportionately to just sit on your hands because you have no visibility into the balance sheets or solvency positions of your counterparties. So you don't want to lend to Lehman, for instance, even if it's 15%, 20% overnight, it could be anything, right? You just don't want to do it because you may never see your, your collateral again. And that's, you know, that's what we see throughout the entire system in the 2008 crisis. And a really prominent and easy intuitive example is the spread between LIBOR and federal funds. Mm. The price of LIBOR, which is offshore US dollar, unsecured US dollars, went through the roof beginning on August 9th, 2007. Mm -hmm. So like you would expect any, any particular, any, you know, plain vanilla uh, banking, the liquidity crisis, the price of money offshore U S dollars went up and then it stayed up throughout the entire crisis period, which is kind of, okay, where are the dealers? They should be, they should be going in that into that market and lending when they didn't. And of course, during the two, the worst of the 2008 crisis in uh, September and October of 2008, the LIBOR rates just skyrocketed and still mm. 
nobody was coming into the markets. And the other side was federal funds, which is unsecured lending domestically in the federal funds market. The price of money in those markets went through the floor. Mm. Counterintuitively, you think, why is federal funds money going way down? There's an overabundance of cash in those markets, whereas money offshore and in, in, uh, still U.S. dollars, but in LIBOR, rates are skyrocketing. And that spread was never, never fixed throughout the entire crisis, nor did the Federal Reserve really understand what was breaking down here, which mm. was the introduction, introduction of the trust factor in many different ways. For example, uh, if you break down the federal funds rate, a lower rate doesn't necessarily mean that there's an overabundance of funds. It might mean that there's an overabundance of funds for a few, fewer, uh, smaller subset of counterparts. Mm. So if you were, say, IBM or Apple or Google, you could lend, you could borrow all the cash you wanted at unsecured rates because, you know, anybody with spare cash was looking for the safe counterparty right. to lend to. You go outside the U.S. in these uh, offshore U.S. dollar markets, you don't really know much about who's on the other side of them. So you don't want to lend at all into any of those markets, no matter who's really borrowing in them. So you have this very different characteristic of what is essentially supposed to be a U.S. monolithic U.S. dollar money market, which was instead breaking down and fragmenting by you know, different characteristics, including you know, information asymmetry. That's interesting. So the, uh, um... I guess my interpretation of that would be the further out into the euro dollar system, the more opaque and counterparty risk ridden it becomes. So there's a yep. shortage of, you can't price the money high enough to get people to lend because there's more risk effectively. Whereas right. closer, that- closer to these big bracket business balance sheets, it's they're much more credit worthy and uh, defined counterparties. And that's negative elasticity in another form, right? Because wow. the economy, the financial system requires risk taking where there shouldn't be such a difference between the best quality and the, and the worst quality. There should be a much narrower spread between them because you know, that's how a market works. It's supposed to be everybody's competing for the same funds. Right. But if those funds suddenly start to preference only the best quality borrowers, you can see how it leads to only increasing trouble. And it's, again, that where that really becomes really dangerous is because nobody has the ability to really see inside of these marketplaces and see that actually going on. All you see is the LIBOR rate, the published LIBOR rate going through the roof and the published effective federal funds rate going through the floor. And you're thinking, my God, what the hell's going on here? You can't make sense of what, unless you're in that marketplace. And by the way, the Federal Reserve never really resolved this either. So they weren't really effectively thinking about through, uh, through these things anyway. Yeah. So it's, 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 you know, information asymmetry is already a president in the system to begin with, and then it gets worse and worse and worse. And as you said, money is all about trust. It's, that's mm-hmm. what it's really, that's what money is really supposed to be. Yeah. And we had this interbank euro dollar global spanning reserve currency system that had developed for decades and everybody thought was really trustworthy, especially the stuff that's collateralized. And then all of a sudden, August of 2007, you can't trust anything. You right. can't even trust the safe collateral. You can't trust federal funds. What is federal fund? I mean, you can't trust any of these things. And then you start thinking about, well, what the hell does the Federal Reserve, what good is a central bank as it's currently, uh, such, you know, how's it, how it actually works today? What good is that in this type of a breakdown? Yeah, it's an excellent point. Um, I do want to read one thing. This is from one of the pieces you posted. And it's interesting that it is such... I'll just read. So the three-month LIBOR, which is the London Interbank Offered Rate, increased 12 basis points from 5.38% to 5.50%, which doesn't sound like, I mean, it sounds like just an ephemeral headline, right? Like no one even, know, most people have no idea what that means, but it's catastrophic actually. And you say that led to the triggering of a global dollar shortage and financial crisis. And I'll read this excerpt. Said, quote, that meant that for more than a month, euro dollars were in very short supply as LIBOR persisted above its previously structurally apparent relationship. At the same exact time, federal funds were overly plentiful, and thus the geographic fragmentation that eventually led to the panic was opened, never to be resolved by a policymaking framework incapable of understanding exactly that. For, quote unquote, dollars, to be at odds in such dramatic fashion on both sides of the Atlantic, ostensibly delinking banking institutions from themselves, 
and their subsidiaries was the end of the road for the financial system as it existed from the 1980s up to that point, which again is 2008. It was from there a fully violent paradigm shift, unquote. So this seemingly innocuous 12 basis point shift in the three month LIBOR was, was it the canary in the coal mine or was it the, uh, for a broader, um, I, I guess, adverse event for the global financial system? Or was this something that this is a lagging indicator? Where did this fall exactly? That uh, was the explosion. That was the, the earthquake. Explosion. That was the rupture. So you had mm-hmm. the canary in the coal mine, which was your earlier in 2006, you know, things like Euro dollar futures, the curve inverted, which said something's wrong here. Mm. The, this, this little 12 basis point move in LIBOR was the point in which that was it. The thing blew up. If you're thinking about it in terms of a rocket, you know, how a rocket produces a very narrow trail while it's going, Mm -hmm. then it explodes and you have this, you know, have the fireball. And that's really that 12 basis point move was the thing that said, "Uh oh, this thing's broken. And the reason why that 12 basis point was so significant is because before that time, these money market rates operated in a hierarchy, very closely connected. So you never saw a three months LIBOR or one month LIBOR move very far from federal funds rates mm-hmm. because there were dealers that were that were policing these spreads. That's what I mean, essentially a dealer is supposed mm-hmm. to do, you know, lending and taking away lending as prices move on an interbank, ba- you know, on a day interday basis. And so up until that point, these money markets, this global U.S. dollar money market looked like a monolithic whole because rates never really moved that far from each other. There was a very defined hierarchy that dominated because the system seemed to work. And it worked because this dealer network, this interbank network seemed to be you know, robust, not fragile, reinforced. So they were arb- arbitraging away any deltas in the market, basically. Absolutely. And yeah. they, they were so good at it. LIBOR had barely moved for years out in rela- the spread of LIBOR to federal funds mm. was so predictable and so constant. It, was, mm. it really came to be thought of as this is just one global market whole. Wow. Because there's obviously money outside the U.S., there's free funds inside the United States, and it's all it's all seamless. It all just mm. works really well. And the, if your if if your problem is in money dealers and their balance sheet capacities, and they're doubting the collateral and how they fund their own activities, and suddenly the dealers are no longer there, what would you expect to find? Right. You would expect right. to find suddenly the seamless hole begins to fragment. No longer is it operating in such dependable fashion. And so that's really what August 9, 2007 was. It was the first indication that suddenly what was supposed to be a seamless hole operating together as if it was a one large system began to break apart. Hmm. And that was really the moment where you could see this is the system isn't just cracking, it has already cracked and it's only going to get worse from that point forward. And it had to this day, Money markets have never regained their hierarchical condition. You've got repo rates that no longer behave. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got LIBOR and federal funds all over the place. Spreads are, you know, TED spreads going up and down. And so August 9th, 2007 was when the day the thing exploded. The fragmentation began and began became too seriously because, again, basically put it on a very basic level. It wasn't subprime mortgages. It was trust in the system right. in all of these various ways. Wow. Well said. I, I'm reminded here and this seems to be a common dynamic of fiat is it, it, you know, maybe not just fiat This is a little more general, but when we try and attempt to suppress short-term volatility with government intervention of different sorts, whether that's a currency intervention or a legislative intervention intervention, um, it tends to have the effect of delaying that volatility, but exacerbating it at the same time. And, you know, Taleb gives a good example of, uh, the small, frequent, localized forest fire versus when we intervene with that natural process, you have these giant catastrophic conflagrations that burn away the topsoil and all that. So it seems to be uh, very deeply related. Something about when when we intervene into complex systems we don't understand, we often create uh, results that backfire in a lot of ways. Um, and I'm wondering here if that's not something similar, right? We, we thought we took the the relationship between Fed funds and LIBOR to be a given, as you said, but yeah. it was in effect just being, um, it was recency just bias. reflecting, yeah, recency bias and reflecting yeah. the uh, the delayed volatility, which we eventually see the actual effects of when it does rupture. 
Yeah, it's and it's you know we fool ourselves into believing that we can. Oh, we've developed new ways of managing this excess leverage. Right. That was the big thing, and especially that that created this euro dollar boost in the eighties and nineties was the quantification of risk measures. Mm -hmm. I think we talked about that before. Risk metrics in ninety five. Before that, with LTCM, what they're doing, balance, you know, VAR, value at risk calculations, yeah. and things. We deluded ourselves into believing that we, yes, we're doing some of the things that had always gone wrong in history. But we'll do them right this but we time. We figured it we out. Have, this time it's different, we right? Figured it out. Yeah, we got it this time. Look at LIBOR, Fed Fund. All this stuff seems to work, and you know, nothing bad has gone wrong. So obviously, nothing bad will ever go wrong. You yes. know, get into recency bias and things. Yeah, it absolutely is the same human nature repeated all over again, just given different kinds of forms. You know, a lot more computers and mathematical models and things like that, and we delude ourselves into believing that this time it'll work out because. We were, we're just much smarter. We had much higher capabilities and we've, we've designed robust systems. And I think that's a really good point about Taleb is, you know, fragility isn't the fact, you know, robustness isn't the fact that something bad hasn't gone wrong. In many ways, you want things to go wrong yeah. consistently because that reinforces the fact that it actually is robust. Where a yeah. fragile system, you may is you, the one you don't know is fragile because nothing seems to go wrong for a long time. Right. And all of a sudden, boom, it breaks. And it breaks yeah. not just a little bit, it breaks in catastrophic fashion, which is exactly what happened in August of 2007. It just, the, the system seemed to be really good, smartest, really, I mean, the Ivy League mathematicians, <laughs> you know, statistical models, the Gaussian Coppola that governs securitization prices, all of the stuff seemed scientifically determined mm -hmm. by some very smart people and you know go back to ltcm robert merton nobel prize winner i mean it was bulletproof it was science it was objective right and, and it was really stupid yeah <laughs> <laughs> so i remind i think was it in the i forget the nifty 50 i forget what decade that was but that was around the, the time well actually it was pre-depression the one guy infamously said infamous infamously said that he thought stocks had reached a permanently high plateau. Yeah, and then that you was had the nifty 50 in the fifties or sixties, maybe um, where they just thought these stocks went up forever effectively. Yep. So we keep self-deceiving actually in, in this process. And if you look, if you study currency a little more deep in history, I look at like the, uh, the French, uh, as, I think it's pronounced assignat, the assignat, as we would say it in yeah. American French. Um, <laughs> Don't even try. Just assignat. Yeah. <laughs> that currency catastrophe was a roughly three generations after they had had one before. So it's like every few generations, we seem to forget the lessons of our forebears. And we like we tell ourselves we figured it out this time with our fancy mathematical models and whatever else. And then it just blows up. And then those people sort of learn the lessons. We, we have a some semblance of reality again, and then we forget a few generations later. And I think to your point, looking at what is, what is the central bank to do in that scenario, right? All they can do is play cleanup. It's not like they can do, try to. <laughs> they don't even have the mechanisms or the visibility to do anything preemptively, um, more but then, or less. But you can I mean, see I, why from, yeah, from Ben Bernanke's perspective, he might look at something like Bear Stearns and think, wow, I don't know what to do specifically about collateral or pricing in these markets, but if I bail out Bear Stearns or make it look like Bear Stearns is surviving, mm -hmm. maybe that will calm everybody down. Right. You know, be, maybe if people think I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to save individual institutions, then that will, that will, that will reignite or get people to think, you know, okay, this, maybe there's some trust I can, mm -hmm. I can depend on, I can sink my teeth into and start to go back toward a normal thing. But you know, as what you he's doing said, is putting out a small forest fire, right? <laughs> or just a little corner of a raging conflagration when everybody's yeah. looking at the raging conflagration. Ben Bernanke's over here saying, "Look, we put out this tree." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh yeah, the yeah. whole the rest of the forest is on fire. Great job, Ben. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's really what it was, and it's you know, I think there's even something even more insidious about this, and it's what we just talked about before with opacity and the lack of information is that. Not only has the euro dollar system made it harder to look into what's going on, there's a you know this this high degree of quantification mathematics to it that makes it even more difficult for regular people. Forget regular right. the layperson's not going to understand the Gaussian Coppola and why that's a big problem. Yeah. 
it's an even pro it's an even big problem for people in the system. You've got bank yeah. heads who don't understand what their banks are actually up to. Right. It's a because they box. can't. I mean, they're not the ones down there writing on mathematical equations on the chalkboard. So you don't even right. know what your bank's up to. And central bankers, they have no idea what's going on either. So it's as you said, we've introduced extra elements of complexity that actually make the system's functions that much more remote from the people using and the people depending upon it because it's almost like you have to have a specialist degree to even understand mm-hmm. what the hell's going on here. And I can tell you from personal experience, the people who are supposed to know and have these specialist degrees, they don't know either. So right, it's, right. it's even that much more difficult. And you're right. There's almost like this fourth turning element to it where we convince ourselves, you know, with the further away we get from the last one, you know, the more we've convinced ourselves that we've solved all the world's problems, it's all yes. we've taken care of everything. So we never have to worry about downsides ever again. And, and reinforce by recency bias, confirmation bias, you know, all of the, we start operating in these echo chambers. Um, I think just to tie that to Austrian economics is that, that delayed or suppressed volatility becomes delayed and exacerbated volatility. I think that's the Austrian business cycle theory in a nutshell. It's like every time we print, we try to print over these errors or nationalize um, toxic assets or institutions that we're just kicking the can down the road. Like the market has to clear that error at some point in some way. Right. Um, you can try and smooth right. it with inflation and intervention, but that seems to kick back more often than it gives you a smooth yeah, path. It forward. amplifies the problem where I disagree with the general. I mean, I agree with that, what you just said, mm. but where I think people get it wrong is they think the central bank is the one that's done that. Right. They blame the Fed through interest rate mechanism or whatever, whatever they can come up with their right. head. They said the Fed is the one that's reduced, the, you know, reduced the amplification of the, you know, volatility in these marketplaces when that's not the case. That that money printing, for lack mm-hmm. of a better term, is done by this bank system. Right. This, the Federal Reserve is essentially a bystander, mm-hmm. which is how you get to something like 2008. Because if the central bank was this this effective, all powerful money printer, you never would have had that breakdown to begin with. Right. So, so that's gets, I think. Sorry to interrupt. I just I was going to say no, that I, this gets into your point. I think that this comes again from your writing. Um, the central bank model. This is this is my interpretation of it. And I'll read some excerpts from you. It seems like you've said something to the tune of the central bank model has effectively been forcefully decentralized by the emergence of a euro dollar system. Or maybe to say that differently is the central bank has had steadily less influence on the total global market for money as the euro dollar system has grown. So it's moved from a lender of last resort model to a market of last resort model that's kind of gone around this central institution. And so then the Fed is no longer a central bank, but it's becoming more of a marginal asset buyer. And then the excerpt here I'd like to read is, you said, quote, basically this non-central bank, central bank still tries to act as a circuit breaker under crisis, but employing very different means at very different times, buying impaired assets as markets break down rather than currency elasticity before they do, unquote. So effectively, the Fed becomes this, uh, you know, they're picking winners and losers. They're kind of interrupting the process of capitalism. They're introducing this big uh, source of political noise into the free market dynamics of, of capital allocation and error clearing. Um, but they're not what we've, you know, traditionally believe is some monolithic institution pulling this. They're not the puppet master. Or maybe they were the puppet master, but they've really lost control as a result of the euro dollar system. Yeah, it goes back to that. You know, I think we talked about that before in previous uh, our previous talks that back when the euro dollar system really got in, going in the 50s and 60s, that meant monetary evolution such to the point that central banks realized they couldn't keep up with it. Mm-hmm. Therefore, if you can't keep up with money, you can't be a central bank. Mm-hmm. We're talking about central banking along the lines of the Walter Badgett model, which is, you know, lend freely at high rates on good collateral. That's what a central bank yeah. is supposed to do with and they couldn't even define money, right? Like, right. not only so can we, I keep up with it, they can't even define it. Right. How, I mean, how is the, how is the Federal Reserve going to intervene directly in something like the currency derivatives markets, right? right. I mean, theoretically, they possibly could. I doubt they could, but, you know, theoretically, that's, 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 it's not even going to happen. So it's not really a central bank anymore. And that was proved 
without a shadow of a doubt, that's what the first global financial crisis was, was basically showing the world that these central banks are not actually central banks. And they knew it. They mm. knew long ago that the monetary system had left them behind. And what they thought they could do was manipulate psychology and behavior such that they wouldn't need to know all this monetary stuff. Mm -hmm. For example, like we just said, if we bail out Bear Stearns and get people to think that's a positive outcome, maybe that will get you know, some positive sentiment and still enough trust. We don't have to know about this monetary stuff and collateral shortages and securities mm -hmm. lending, but we'll we'll have reassured enough dealers that they'll start stepping back into the marketplace and doing all of these various details that we don't know. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes all about psychology. Mm -hmm. And then that didn't really work. It didn't work with Lehman and AIG, obviously. Of course, Lehman, they let go and AIG, they decided why COVID, they decided to bail out. But by then the system was already too far gone. And since then, they've decided, well, we can't do that. That didn't really work out very well for anybody. So what we'll try to do, so we'll try to interrupt these illiquid markets before those prices start to impair dealer activities and trust and things like that. Mm -hmm. So if we see that the price of mortgage bonds are going down for reasons that we don't agree with, we think it's illiquid marketplace mm -hmm. because we can't we can't create some currency elasticity to stuff in the you know, actual effect of money into those markets. We'll just buy. We'll just start yeah. buying those assets. Yeah to wow. raise their price so that dealers think, oh, there's a dependable mortgage bond price. I don't need to revalue my current, my collateral book and things like that. And that's where it becomes not a central bank. It's something very different because a yeah. central bank is supposed to be the circuit breaker at the front of the crisis, whereas this is a sort of kind of a janitor who cleans up right. after the crisis has gotten bad. That's why I use the janitor analogy. It's the, OK, we can't prevent a crisis, but we can maybe hopefully keep it from becoming really, really bad. Right. And that was that was born in December of 2008 with the first announcement of quantitative easing, where if you actually read through the FOMC minutes for that meeting, it was essentially a surrender. They basically yes. said, we've tried everything up to this point. We don't know what else to do. So we're going to try this other central bank type model, which is not a central bank. And we'll just start buying assets and hope that we'll fix the the market price, which will no longer be a market price, will try to fix the price of these markets. And that will that will be the way in which we can become the circuit breaker, even though it's sort of at the end of the process rather than the beginning. Right. And that's really that's really what the central banks have become. And they call it market of last resort rather than lender of last resort, because you can't be lender if you don't know what money is. Right. So the best you can possibly do is market of last resort, which is really Again, it's mostly about psychological effects. Right. And in some ways, it kind of sounds intuitive, like maybe that should work even more effectively than the other way, because if you're raising market prices through purchases, then maybe that would be more effective than trying to just kind of throw blanket money into us, you know, elasticity, mm -hmm. that kind of a thing. It sounds like it's even more direct and more honest than the other way, when in fact, it's 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 even worse. It's much worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, all right. So central banks have become the post economic catastrophe janitors great that sounds even like a good and useful service but i i would argue that by engaging and directly bidding on these assets they're they're propagating false price signals which is leading to further capital misallocation and disequilibrium and all the, all the bad things that markets are intended to clear um again delaying the inevitable mm -hmm.